to worship this morning. Please take a moment to quiet your minds and center your hearts as we hear these words found in Psalm 95, verses 1 through 6. Come, let us sing for joy to the Lord. Let us shout aloud to the rock of our salvation. Let us come. come. Let us come for him with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. For the Lord is the great God, the great King above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth, and the mountain peaks belong to him. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands formed the dry land. Come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our Maker. Please continue to silently prepare your heart for worship today.
anyway, I'm so thankful that we could come together and worship this morning. And just a few short announcements. First, Pastor Jeff is again with us this Sunday, and we're thankful for that and sharing the word with us. And next Sunday, God willing, and the city doesn't shut us all down, um, we will be doing Hanging of the Greens next Sunday. So if you can help with that, um, masks are appropriate. Socially distancing, we'll figure out. But um, anyway, if you can help with that next Sunday, that would be awesome. Also, this morning, choir, the Christmas choir will be rehearsing. So, and then Tara had a short announcement. Yeah, um, Missouri Baptist, I work with them part-time, and since they weren't able to do a concert this year, because of all the restrictions, they made a CD. It's a Christmas CD. And we're actually singing one of the songs that's on the CD, hopefully. But anyway, I have them available if anybody's interested. They're using the money to set up a scholarship fund. So. Awesome. So I'm hoping has a CD and Tara has the copies. And so see Tara if you find one. Uh, oh, ten dollars. It's ten dollars, yeah. which is a steal. And for there's twelve, twelve Christmas songs. On. Twelve Christmas songs. So yeah, goes to Moab. Good, good thing. Um, also, if you had seen in the back, uh, Women's Fellowship has baskets. And actually, all the funds that are raised from that will be used to help with the ministries that they donate to, of which one of them is the church. But it, everything goes to the different ministries that the Women's Fellowship uses, outreaches, and disconnects with the community. So I think that's it, unless anyone else has any other announcements. Cool. All right. Praises and prayers. Does anybody have any praises or prayers or sharing? Prayers for my brother, Jim. He uh, took a fall and he, um, you know, cracked some ribs and has cuts on his head. Prayers for Sharon's brother. He, he fell and actually has a uh, crack uh, in his, some of his vertebrae and um, wound in his head, on his head. So anyway, just prayers of healing for him. Um, I know from my perspective, just prayers as the city and county and the country goes through closing down just what their response is to COVID-19. And this just that God would bring healing to our land and, and utilize this time for us to just remember the importance of friends, family, community, and just praising God for all that he has given us and turn something that's negative into a blessing. So, my perspective. Um, anyone else? We had a family friend pass away of ALS after a long struggle. Uh, her name's Melissa Pop, so we pray for the Pop family. <laughs> pray for the Pop family. Um, she had ALS and she passed away this past week, and they're friends of Jenny Clumps. How did the stem cell? Stem cell went really yeah. well. We don't really know the result. We won't know for four months, but it went good. That's awesome. Yeah. So, Dave had stem cell and Prayerfully, it will be helpful in he can get, back get, back, get back to work and get back to being Dave, which he's already Dave. I'm sorry, that sounds horrible. <laughs> anyway, just. Awesome. Praises. Jan Frank is off of quarantine. She never really seemed to be sick. So, from the fact of possibly being, you know, COVID-19. So just praise us for that. And Gus is here with us this morning, and that's a good thing. And then Pat Elmo is doing well. She is actually in a rehab facility in Herculaneum. Uh, talked to her this past week, and um, she actually has a great, you know, positive attitude about just the healing. She asked everyone, if you get a chance, please call Jack. You know, she just... She worries about him more than I think she does herself. So anyway, Jack's doing okay, but it's just Jack's, you know, home, and he doesn't have Pat with her, so, which can be a blessing, but also he needs to have Pat with him. So anyway, sorry. I was going to say, I have both as well, praise and for us. My uncle that had been diagnosed with prostate cancer actually contracted COVID a couple weeks ago.
Dr. Sebi from America Walking with his history of illness and everything, his age, but it, I mean, it's just the hand of God and prayers I know that have brought him out of it. Um, just prayers that they continue to heal. He and his wife both have it and uh, have it on him, but he's doing well. We're just thankful. Prayers of healing for Tara's uncle and just keep in your prayers for her aunt also. And just, he went to the hospital, had a low-grade fever instead of a high fever. And um, they both have COVID. And just prayers of healing for them. Um, prayers for everyone in Central America, because they have another hurricane here down on them. Yeah. Um, that is going to be making landfall here shortly. Gus and I are obsessed with the weather. That's part of our learning thing. So we have kept an eye on this one. We didn't, it was less than a 40% chance that it's going to become a name storm. And pray that my parents are bored now and at home and happy and sending me gifts of 48 rolls of toilet paper yesterday. Praises her parent, her mom is home. So was, you know, healing is going well. And then just prayers for this next um, hurricane that's coming and looking to hit South America again, Honduras again. Quick update on the guys' family. Marty guys and Diana are doing well. Um, they actually, this past week, if you follow them on Facebook, saw that they were helping it up, cleaning up in an area, um, I'm not sure how far away from them, but he was, you know, they were helping with that and just as their outreach and working with the community. And you know, um, I think pictures say a thousand words and just to see the devastation and the people that are going through it, but then the positivity that they have. So just prayers for Honduras as they bunker down for another one. But the guys' family themselves are doing well and just seems to be doing very well. Anyone else? Pastor Jeff. Lots to write down this week. That's great. That's great. Let's pray together. God, we come before you, and we lift up these prayers and praises. What a tumultuous time, what a time of anxiety and depression for many of us. And Lord, we just rest in you. Father, you are sovereign over all things. And although we don't have control, Father, we give that control over to you. Father, we pray for Sharon's brother, Jim, as he continues to heal. We thank you that it wasn't as bad as it could have been. We pray for continued healing of his ribs and his head and his back. Father, we lift up the Potts family as they've lost a loved one through an agonizing disease. And we just thank you that, that you give us comfort. Father, we, we lift up Tara's uncle who's still on the road to recovery. But Lord, we praise you for for giving him safety and bringing him home and, and giving him protection and strength. Father, we lift up the leaders in our city and in our in the county and around our country, Lord, as they have difficult decisions to make. There are really no win situations. And so, Father, we just pray for wisdom and discernment as they help to seek to protect people. And so we just lift up those friends and family as we hear a number of uh, number of friends, family, co-workers that are getting sick. Lord, we just pray for their healing, their restoration, and pray for protection. Father, we're thankful that Gus is here. We're thankful that Jan Frank is off quarantine. We continue to pray for Jack and Pat. I'm glad they are doing well. And Father, we, we continue to pray for the guys as they are where you have called them, but also in the midst of another uh, storm that's Ending to pound down on their country. We just pray for the people of Honduras, Lord, as they are looking at and seeing this storm head on. We just pray that you would continue to build up people, build up believers to help love and serve those around them. Father, we pray for our morning this morning that our hearts will be turned to you and that you would turn our hearts of stone to hearts of flesh. Father, may you bless this, this worship gathering this morning. In Jesus' name.
with you again this morning in person, and we will enjoy it at least while it lasts. If you would, uh, take out your Bibles or your phones or however you read the Word, and whether you turn the pages or swipe to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter, or I'm sorry, Matthew chapter 6. We are in the middle of a series, a brief series on the Lord's Prayer. Or I'm sorry, the uh, Sermon on the Mount. Today we'll be talking about the Lord's Prayer. <laughs> but the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus really introduces the idea, the concept of the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God, in its essence, is different than the kingdom of the world. The kingdom of the world is built on politicians and corporations and power and intelligence and, and influence. Whereas the kingdom of God is built on humility and meekness and love and servanthood. And so here in the Sermon on the Mount is, is such a great message for today. In today's tumultuous times where we have a lot of anxiety, everything, everything is out of our control. As I hear Patty sharing, we don't even know if we're going to be here next week. We're just waiting to hear uh, what the city or the counties decide. We don't have control over these things. And when we don't have control, that anxiety begins to creep in. Those doubts begin to creep in. That anger and those different emotions begin to come out in different ways. And so my hope is, is by going and studying the, the Sermon on the Mount, we actually turn our attention back to the kingdom of God and know that Jesus is still on the throne, that regardless of pandemics, elections, whatever it may be that we may be troubling us, that God has everything under control. And so if you would join with me as I, I read this morning from God's Word, verses uh, 1 through 15, or 18. It says this, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For then you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. Thus, when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, and that they may be praised by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret that your Father who sees in secret will reward you. <clears throat> and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door. Pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. For they disfigure their faces, and their fasting may be seen by others. Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that we get a go back in time. You get to hear your words in your sermon, encouraging, giving, praying, and fasting. Father, I pray that as we hear your word, as we engage with our hearts, Father, that you would help us to see the sin that's inside each of us. Father, how we look for good 
praise from other people, to help people think well of us. How we do things out of motives that are not for you, but for ourselves. So Father, I pray that you would help us search our hearts, our motives, and help us to turn our hearts and our ideas back to you. Thank you for gathering us together, and we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. And so I really struggled on what to call the sermon. It's always helpful to have a title of a sermon so you kind of know which, which way to go or what, what the main topic's going to be, what the theme is, if you will. And so yesterday, as I was praying through and looking back over this passage, it really is, do not be like the hypocrites. Often it feels like today we see the idea of hypocrites in the news, in on social media, everyone is calling out everyone else. And really, it took me a few minutes yesterday, and I went back and I looked at the origins of the word hypocrite. And it's interesting because it actually is a Greek, Greek word called hypocrates. It's actually a derivative from the Greek word. And it actually has its uh, heart and its start in the theater of all places. Back in the Greek, Greek times, they didn't have a full cast or an ensemble to come up and play every character. But what they would have is they would have a few actors, and what they would do is they'd have a big mask. And they would change masks for each role that they were up in. And so the word actually means under mask in the Greek. And so when we see the word hypocrite, it's actually meaning under a mask. You are presenting something that's untrue or something else or a different person or different actor or different role. And that's what Jesus is really talking about in all three of these areas in this passage today. Each, three, each of these three areas, giving alms to the needy or giving donations to the needy. The Lord's Prayer and praying and fasting were three pillars of the Jewish community and how they would perform acts of service daily to God. These were their religious acts. This was helping them establish their good standing before God. And as a lot of this sermon is really geared towards helping people turn their minds away from the religious leaders that are really looking at influence and control over the Jewish people, Jesus is really encouraging them not to worry about what others think, but their relationship with God. And we see that through each of these passages this morning. Beginning with verses 1 through 4, again it says this, Beware of practicing your righteousness before other people in order to be seen by them. For you will have no reward from your Father who is in heaven. So the opening salvo here is beware of practicing your righteousness before other people. This is hard. This is hard for the church. How many times have you grown up or you were in a church and you know who I'm talking about? You have someone in your mind right now that you're picturing, that whether it's somebody in your past or maybe your present, that when you think of them, their talk doesn't match their walk. That they always were using extra big words that no one knew the, the definition of. They'd always wear a little bit of extra bling, if you would, of making sure they look really nice when they come to church. They say a lot of theological terms that maybe not everyone understands, but they want to make sure that they know that they're smart. All of this is practicing righteousness before others, and as we go through this passage, those keep getting brought up. Because it, it's, it's showing where their heart is. In Psalms it says, out of the heart the mouth speaks. And in these passages, what we see is their righteousness, what, what they really believe in, what they really trust, what they really value, is oozing out of them, whether they realize it or not. And so here, in this first portion, Jesus is really focusing on giving to the needy. Verse 2 says this, Thus when you give to the needy, sound no trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, that they may be praised by the others. Truly I say to you that they have received their reward. And so often whenever 
whenever they would come in to give in the synagogues, there would be a, a box, there would be a, a way to hear the coins that would drop in the coin box. And you know how big the coin is by how it was dropped. And often these religious leaders, these people that wanted to be seen for their good works of how much money they were giving, would, would make sure that they, it would drop in such a way that they would hear, everyone would hear it. And Jesus says, whenever they blast their trumpets, when everybody, they have everyone look at me on how much I'm giving, they have already received the reward. What does Jesus mean by that? What, what reward have they got? Well, here what they're wanting is they're wanting people's admiration. They want people to come and say, hey, I want to sit by this guy because he's a mover or a shaker. He's an influencer. Look at all this money he's giving. I want to sit by him at the parties. I want to go to his parties. Because that is the reward. They want people to see them. They want people to think how well they are and how generous they are. They're sending a trumpet for everyone to know. So this is those humble praises that you ever see on social media that usually accompany that hashtag bless. It's like, man, I was I received my new car today. Hashtag bless. Trying to incorporate this religious overtone with this great new thing that I just received. Hey, everybody, look at me. And so here, Jesus is exhorting everyone, don't let everybody see what you're giving or what you're doing. It's not about other people. It's about what's going on in your heart, in your relationship with God. You don't have to let everyone in the world know of how generous you are and what you do and how you give. In fact, in 3, he says this, But when you go and give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving may be in secret, and your Father who sees you in secret will reward you. I remember talking to one of my kids younger, whenever they were younger, and they said, How, how does this work? How, how does my left hand not know what my right hand is doing? And I think you can see in their mind, they were trying to figure out this way to like have a hand behind their back and not know exactly what they were doing. But Jesus, what he's wanting us to understand is that we want to do it in such a way that we do not want any praise from anyone else. Because Jesus ultimately knows our heart. And our heart, for some of us, our brokenness and our sinfulness really is compelled for others to and I'm one of those people. I love to have people say nice things about me. Words of affirmation is one of my love, love languages. I want to be known that I'm doing well, and man, that makes me feel so good. But the problem is, is that if that's what, what I put my hope in, what I put my trust in, then every time I post something on Facebook, I'm going to be constantly looking how many likes it's getting. And then if I didn't get enough likes, okay, what if, how could I have made this? So you get more likes. I should have put puppies or kitties in this. Then I would have gotten more likes. Because ultimately, I'm not worried about the content. I'm worried about the likes. And the same goes with our giving. It's good to give. In fact, as I was studying this, the one thing that stood out is Jesus doesn't say, hey, don't worry about doing any of these things. Don't worry about giving to the needy. Don't, don't worry about praying. Don't worry about passing. That's all of the old law. We don't need to worry about that. He doesn't say that. He says these are all good. Just watch your heart as you do them. What is the countenance of your heart as you do each of these? So as we give to the needy, let's be aware of how we give. So that it's not about trumping our goodness, our generosity. Because ultimately, where does all of our good things come from? God. Our jobs. Our house. Our cars. Everything that we have is a gift from God. God is generous to us so that we can be generous and a blessing to others. And so we don't need to give glory to ourselves. We need to give glory to God. Verse 5, and when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, and that they may be seen by others. 
Truly, I say to you, they have received their reward. Pray. This one's tough. Usually every time I hear the Sermon on the Mount, there's always usually just a sermon based on just the Lord's Prayer. And so, typically in churches, as I've been in over the years, we've always been very aware of how we pray. There's some churches I've been in that have been very more high church and very articulate in the words they use and the, the way they pray. I've been in other churches where they write out every word and just read the words. I've had other, been in other churches where we shouldn't read the words. We should just let the Holy Spirit go through us and let's just go with the Holy Spirit. And ultimately what Jesus is wanting here is to have a conversation with our Father. And letting him know the, the place where our hearts are, what we are concerned about, what we're fearful of, and how we need him in our own lives. And here Jesus is making sure that when we pray, we're not doing it for the spectacle of others. We're not doing it to be passive aggressive as we're in a prayer meeting and we're praying for the person three or four people down and saying, oh Lord, please be with so and so or this unspoken prayer request about this person who's going through X, Y, Z problem that everyone really knows what it's about and who we're praying for. But this is my way to, to criticize or rebuke them in a religious way. And Jesus is saying it's not about doing those things. And here he encourages us when we pray, go into our room and shut the door and pray to our Father is in secret. Do you remember the story of Daniel? This is what got Daniel in problem. So it's not necessarily a bad thing to go in and open your window to pray. This is a way that, that Daniel probably helped his heart calibrate, see the beautiful countryside, and God, thank you for this beautiful day. But many times, some of our repetitions, some of our, our liturgies that we have, that we have built to help us to calibrate our lives to God, sometimes they get so rote, they get so monotonous, they get so just about the, the rhythms that they lose the essence of here they, of what they're for. And here, the Jewish people had gotten such a rhythm of opening the windows and standing at the window so everybody sees them praying that it really wasn't about the prayer, it was about seeing them doing the prayer. That, hey, I'm doing my righteous act today. I'm doing my quiet time, God. Look at me. Everybody look how holy and righteous I am as I do this before everyone else, right? And so Jesus is making sure that their hearts aren't about that. It isn't about being seen. It's about God. And that's why he says, your reward shouldn't come from man. It shouldn't come from that approval because that's gonna, you're gonna need more of that later today. Have your reward come from God, who is the living water that never runs out. And he instructs us when we pray, in verse 7, when you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think that they will be heard for their many words. And here, during Jesus' time, even today, we may see people who are praying that are just praying the same thing over and over and over again, thinking because their long prayers, which yes, I often get, especially at Thanksgiving, my prayers before we eat, get criticized regularly. But it's not about just being repetitive, just to string it out to make God hear us or think well of us. I'm reminded back with Elijah's confrontation with the priest where, there, where the, the fire came down on the altar. If you remember the story in the Old Testament, the, the, the priests of Balaam were trying to, to have a contest with Elijah about whose prayers would be heard. And, and Elijah, they kept praying all day and running around and cutting themselves and trying to get the attention of their God, which never answered their prayer. And then Elijah not only said, hey, this is going to take a minute, but before, before I do my thing, just soak this altar, make sure it's soaked so nothing can burn on its own. And then as he prays, fire comes down from heaven and heaven consumes us. But those priests that kept jumping around... And even Elijah mocked them that maybe your God's in the restroom. That's how bad it was. 
because they were jumping around and they were praying and heaping up words for what? And Jesus here is saying, God hears you. Be intentional. This is a relationship with your dad. How, what type of relationship, how would you have a conversation with your dad? Someone who loves you and cares about you and knows you intimately. In fact, better than you know yourself. Because what does Jesus say in verse 8? Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. Let's take a second. Did you read that? Did you hear this? Your father knows what you need before you ask him. How beautiful is that? I don't have to go to God to tell him my troubles. I don't have to go to God to tell him my worries. I don't have to tell him how I need some money to turn on my heat. I don't need money to tell him how to help fix my issues at work. I don't need to help have him tell him about with my uh, co-workers and my neighbors. He knows already. Because ultimately this is about how we are going to God and not trying to take control over everything ourselves, but give that control back to Him. He already knows. It's not like God, I pray to God and God's like, oh, Jeff, I'm so glad you told me about this. You know, I was so taken care of Patty this week, I totally forgot you. And so let me be sure to take care of this right now. Let me get after it. That's not what he does. He already knows what we need. This is us coming before him and saying, okay, God, here you go. I, I can't do this today at all. But you care about me. You already know about it. So you know what? I'm not going to stress. I don't know how it's going to turn out. And it may not turn out the way I want. But ultimately, you got this. And I'm okay with that. Because you have me. And then Jesus goes in and tells them, pray like this. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. So here with the Lord's Prayer, what do we see? We begin by saying, Father. It's interesting to see how people pray and how they see God because that comes out in their prayers. I have friends who, who are really strong and tough guys. Like, these are the manly men. And they really, they value strength. And often what they say is Almighty God. Now, I don't know if that's conscious or unconscious, or conscious, whatever conscious that is. But what they're using is this form of value that they, they see God as. But here, Jesus is wanting us to remember that this is a relationship. God. Abba is the Hebrew word. This is the word that Jesus would have used. Abba. Daddy. Father. And that's taking our, our minds and it's wrapping around the God of the universe wants to hear from us. Wants to know us. Wants us to tell him what our biggest worries are what our, our praises are, and have a dialogue with them. So when we pray, often in my religious upbringing, it was an obligation. Hey, to do what's right, praying is part of a list of good things to do, so you need to make sure you pray probably three times a day. You know, whenever you wake up, maybe around lunchtime, before you go to bed. Oh, and also at every meal, let's not forget about those, and if you're a good Christian, you're going to do all of these. But what does that do to us? That turns us into a robot just checking off the list of the to-dos. Well, I got the morning prayer done. I got the lunch prayer done. I missed the breakfast prayer, but it was kind of along with that morning prayer. So I'm good, right, God? But no, this is just a conversation with someone that, that you love. I'm so excited whenever I get to talk to my wife after a long day at work. 
whenever she gets home or whenever I get home or when I get that text that she's on her way. And I look forward to talking with her to see how her day went. Why? Because I love her. I want to know how she's doing. What happened? What went on with your day? And it's not like, okay, I've got to talk to my wife again. Man, this is such a burden. Can you, can you tell me, can you summarize this a little bit faster? Because, you know, I've got some, somewhere else to be. No, that's not how we are. When we love someone, when we love something, we can't wait to be in, pre in its presence and learn more about what's going on. If I had an opportunity to sit down with Mike Schell or any of the Cardinals, I would love it. <laughs> and I would say, Let's, how, how can we stretch this out and how can I learn more about what's going on in the inner workings of something that I love and care about? That should be our disposition with God. He loves us. He knows what's going on. We don't need to have a conversation. He's already got the memo. We just need to sit down and take the time to tell him. As studying this, you know, every time I study God's word, it's always fascinating because I always find something new. It's always rich, and I always find something new. This time, as I was studying this passage, you know what stood out to me? The word our before Father. Every other time that I've read this passage, you know how I've read this? My Father. My Father who's in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Because I always take this prayer and say, okay, this is how I need to pray. This is the model of how I pray. So therefore, I'm going to change this word. I'm not going to make it the plural. I'm going to make it the singular about me, my God who's in heaven. But does it say that? No. It says our Father. As believers, this is a corporate experience. He's reminding us we are brothers and sisters in Christ. Through Christ, we have been adopted by God. And it's not us alone on this journey by ourselves. But God has given us brothers and sisters to walk on this strong earth together. That we don't have to do it alone. And so that as we come before God, as I'm praying at home, and as Matt's praying, we're all praying together. And as we're all praying through these prayers and praises as we did earlier, we're praying together as a family, lifting each other up and asking for God to intervene. And we start by hallowing God's name. We are lifting him up and saying, God, you are God, I am not. Even though that's the disposition of my heart, and that's been our disposition since Adam, that I want to be like God, I want to be better than God, I can do this better than you can, God. We start every prayer by relinquishing control and saying, God, you're sovereign, and I'm not. You can handle this better than I can, God. So God, hallowed be your name. And then it's helping to, to reset our mind and calibrate our, our mindset. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And here's this kingdom language back. Because God, you are restoring your kingdom, you are establishing your kingdom here on earth through your son Jesus. Your values, your kingdom is not the values of this world. It's not about how powerful I am. It's not about how much influence I have. It's not about how much, how smart I am. It's about how you are calling us to serve you and love you. And even Jesus will wash the feet of his servants. So we, our mission is for God's kingdom to be established here on earth. Not my kingdom. But God's kingdom. Give us this day our daily bread. I don't know how many times I've had to say this during this whole pandemic fiasco. God, today is too much. Here we go, quarantine again. It's like Groundhog's Day. We're doing the same thing over and over again. God, we're about running out of toilet paper. How are we going to do this? But God has us. God is giving us our daily bread. As he said earlier, is that he knows the, the flowers of the field and the birds of the, the air. Do they not have beautiful clothes? Do they not have enough food? God is giving us our daily bread. And, and friends, we need this more than ever. I was having a conversation with a friend last night. And they're just, they have a lot of things going on 
they, they had a one-year-old, uh, their one-year-old just turned one. So they had their party, but only had a few people because of the pandemic. They just had a remodel done. So they've had dust everywhere in the only place they can really be. They can't really go out and see their friends. Winter is coming. That's not just a reference to a popular show. Winter is almost here, and the, the darkness is getting ready to fall. And that seasonal uh, disorder about being sad is coming upon us. So they're really fearful of this time of sadness and depression that we often feel during the winter whenever it's getting darker out and cold and we're inside anyway. And friends, God is calling us to be a hope during this time. To be a ray of sunlight in their lives to say, hey, I know I haven't seen you in a while, but I'm calling you just to make sure you know you're not alone. That I love you, that I'm praying for you. Do you need anything? Maybe send a letter. Each of those can be a part of our daily bread. How God is using us in the life of someone right now that is looking at potentially another lockdown and saying, how am I going to do this? And part of that is because God has made us a family. He is calling us to check on one another. See how they're doing. Because part of us serving each other is part of that daily bread of what we need. Not just physically, but also mentally and emotionally as well. Forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. This one's hard, right? Because I have people who owe me things. I want that stuff back. I like my stuff. And we often forget on how generous God has been with us and how we are so quick to be the person in the parable who God, who the uh, king forgives them and then we turn around and we want to hold the person accountable of how they've sinned against us or how they owe us and want to send them to jail. But here, Jesus is helping again reorientate our hearts to say it's not about what people owe you. You've been forgiven. You have everything you, have, you need. God is giving you your daily bread. God's got you. Give it up. Let them have it. Bless them. So don't worry about those things. Forgive others as you have been forgiven. Lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's a sign that evil is among us, and we are at war with our thoughts and the sin that's within us. And asking for God's help to not fall into temptation, but to keep our, our hearts that are so prone, prone to wander that's focused on God. For if you forgive others their trespasses, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others their trespasses, neither will your Father forgive your trespasses. This is so hard. So right now, who is this in your life? Someone is, has hurt you. And they need forgiveness. But this is also difficult because many of us have grown up in worlds that abuse has been regularly there. Whether you or abuse as a child, maybe you were in a relationship as you were older, maybe in a marriage. How do you forgive that person? We need to be cautious on forgiveness doesn't mean 100% reconciliation. Just because I forgive you, especially through Jesus, because he has forgiven me, doesn't mean that I'm going to have the same type of relationship that we once had. But here God is, and Jesus is calling us to let go of the hate. Let go of the bitterness. Let go of the resentment. Let Jesus take care of that on the cross. Because if we don't, if we just let that stay inside, it's going to eat away at us. Like a cancer eating us from the inside out. And that's going to come up, like I said several weeks ago, like a beach ball. It's going to come out in different ways and we don't know where, we don't know how violently but those things that do trigger us will come out and it will not and typically maybe in sinful ways against other people. So Jesus is calling us to be aware of the things of our past, of our stories. Go to counseling. Talk through it. See a brother or sister and say, hey, I'm really struggling with this. 
Can you help me pray for you? Help me to be restored. Help me give this over to God. Let him take care of this. The offer of justice. Because if we can't give forgiveness, if we can't forgive those who, who are in our debt, what's it say? Then the Father won't be able to forgive your trespasses. Ultimately, we need to put our hope and trust in God our King who loves mercy and justice. And finally, verse 16 through 18, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, when they have received their reward, but when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face, that your fasting may not be seen by others, but your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. Don't be like the Debbie Downers. You ever been on those, those mission trips, on those serving opportunities, that everybody is just going a little bit slower, they're just making sure everyone knows how hard they're working, although they're not really working a lot. Back in the time, it was commonplace for them to make sure that they, their faces looked a little bit skinnier, to make sure that people knew that they were fasting, to see their righteousness before God. Yep, I'm giving to the poor. Yep, I'm praying. And yep, I'm, I'm hitting all three. I've got all, check, all the boxes checked. I am doing so good. Again, they're wanting other people to know how righteous they are, how holy they are. But really, they're taking the kingdom of man and making sure that, that those, kingdom, those kingdom of man checkboxes are checked so that people would think well of them, that they could have influence, and people would come to them for their advice. How can I be more like you? How can I be more righteous like you? But Jesus is again saying, it's not about that. With each of these three pillars of the Jewish community, Jesus is trying again to turn them on their head and saying, these are not the things you're going to be known for. I know, I know you think that this is how you're going to gain favor with God, but this isn't how you gain favor with God. You have a relationship with Him. You trust Him as your Father who loves you. So we have to ask the question, how, one, how are we doing on this? What are the things that we do religiously that we want people to see us do? We have to ask the question. Is it coming to church? Is it how much we give? Is it how much we sacrifice outside of church? What is it? What do we want people, what values do we have that we want people to think we're great at? We also have to ask the question, who's in our life to tell us? Who do we trust enough to care about us enough to say, hey, why do you pray like that? I've never heard half of those words. Who are you trying to impress? Who's here to ask us the questions? Who's in your life to say, how's your relationship with your, your father going in heaven? How's that going? Because sometimes it's okay to say, not good. I'm kind of mad at God right now. Because I've had this happen, I've had this happen, and I've had this happen. And I need to talk to someone about it. We see in the book of Psalms, laments to God, where there are people, where the, the psalmist David is angry at God. Why are you letting this happen? But all of this, what Jesus is saying in the Sermon on the Mount, is it's about our relationship with God. And all of our emotions matter. And here, Jesus is wanting us to make sure that our relationship with God is like a father. And with a father, he wants us to come with all of who we are and trust him with all of who he is. Friends, as we leave here today, my encouragement is to do some soul work this week. What do I need to help purge and clean out my heart of those things that I'm, I'm feeling like I am making my relationship with God better? Because the truth is, 
Because there's nothing that you can do right now that can make you, that, to make God love you any more than he does right, right now. And conversely, there's nothing you can do that will make him love you any less. And so when we come to the time of prayer, of giving and fasting, we come boldly, not needing recognition from anyone else, but just spending time with our Father, saying, God, you are so good to me. You take such good care of me. Let me rest in your goodness. And let me go forward in helping other people know the hope that I have in you. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. We thank you that when we come together, Father, that you know our hearts. You know what our needs are. Father, we're thankful that you know what we need even before we pray. Often you know what we need even before we realize what we need. And so, Father, I pray that you would help us to seek you more, to love you more, and to love ourselves less. And so, Father, as we we look to spending time with you, praying, fasting, or even giving to others as we Lord. I pray that would not be for our, our glory, but it would be for yours. And we pray all this in the name of your Son, Jesus. Amen. Amen.